From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Don Wilkins, Johnny. Trimutual Limited. Oh, hi, Don. Thanks for the Christmas present. Well, just don't take out the cork near an open flame. Yeah. Uh, say, do you know anything about a guy named Mel Pryker? Nothing good about him. Why? Got himself killed last night. Murdered. Pryker was born to be murdered. Maybe so, but not at our expense. We're holding a $100,000 policy on him. Wow. Who's the beneficiary? His uh, partner, Nick Shern. Nick Shern? You picked a fine pair of rats. Yeah, I know that now. The New York police are holding Shern, but they've got no evidence. Go down there and check it out for us, Johnny. If Nick did the killing, we're off the hook. Any witnesses? One, uh, apparently, the hat check girl in that nightclub of theirs. What's her story? I wish I knew. She's disappeared. We've got to find her, Johnny, before some of Nick's hoodlums find her. Don, maybe they already have. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is the count of expenditures during my investigation of the Nick Shern matter. Item 1, 2280, transportation to New York, tips and incidentals, and taxi fare to the office of Lieutenant Ed Rafferty, Homicide Division, the man in charge of the case. Oh, hiya, Johnny. How have you been? Not bad, Ed. How's the homicide business? Terrible. Did you look at that teletype? Shoplifting. Five complaints right in a row. The week before Christmas, that's all we get. Shoplifters. Mel Pryker wasn't shoplifting. Oh, you working on it, Johnny? Yeah, the insurance angle. Nick Shern's the beneficiary. A hundred grand policy. Oh, you got a tough one, boy. Shern killed him all right, but I don't think we're going to be able to stick him. Come on in the office. Hey, you know what that kid of mine wants for Christmas? Marilyn Monroe? Oh, oh, next year, Johnny. He's only ten, you know. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. No, he, uh, he wants a motorbike. Can you tie that? Ten years old, and he says he needs a motorbike. <laughs> Have a chair. Okay. Well, look, I know a factory representative here will make you a good deal on one, Ed. Eh? Oh, now, forget it, Johnny. No, I was 14 before I even had a pair of roller skates. And then I had to buy them myself. You know, kids are spoiled today. That's the half of what's wrong with them. Uh, ah, there's the file on the case. What little we've got. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, how'd it happen, Ed? Well, you mean, how do I think it happened? That's good enough for me. Mel Pryker and Nick Shern were both in the rackets for years, as you probably know. Yeah, I've heard rumors. Well, a while back, they teamed up and opened a string of supper clubs. That's where Pryker got it, in their main club, the Chez Collette. Strictly legitimate, huh? Well, more or less, I guess. They could afford to be. The dough they were making and arguing over, according to the word around. That's the reason for the killing, the way you see it. Sure, Nick figured if half was good, all the take would be twice as good. And the insurance on top of it. <laughs> You're a fast one, Johnny. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, several people heard the shots about 2.30 in the morning, it was, right after the club closed, but none of them bothered to report it. The cleanup crew came in at 3 and found Pryker's body. He was lying in his office, shot twice, gun on the floor beside him, no prints, with his own gun, and it was kept there in his desk. Where was Nick Shern? Well, we picked him up an hour later at another one of their clubs. The manager was with him, and, uh, oh, Benny Stark. Now, he used Benny, to... Benny, yeah, I know. Trigger man for Nick's mob in the old days. Fifteen years overdue for hanging. <laughs> That's our Benny. Anyhow, they, they both swear that Nick was there from 1.30 on. Uh-huh. What about a paraffin test, Ed? Positive, clear to the elbow, and you can throw it out the window. What do you mean? Earlier that evening, Nick spent two hours at a shooting gallery uptown... Firing a pistol. Ooh, smart, huh? He really planned for it. He really did. If without a witness, we haven't got a chance. I understand there was a witness. Some girl who was mixed up in it. Easy, Johnny. You're talking to a Rafferty. Hmm, so the girl's Irish. Miss Kathleen O'Dare. Old country, back three generations. County Kildare. <laughs> then naturally, she's as innocent as a newborn babe. Naturally. Then how does she figure? Well, a taxi driver who knows her said that he saw her leave the club five minutes after the shots. She denied it, said she'd she left at closing time. Well, now, in my book, she was lying. Scared to talk, huh? Paralyzed. And with plenty of reason. You know Shern's reputation. Mm. 
Well, what about the cab driver? Oh, he changed his story. He said it might have been some other girl he saw. Oh, no, no. Tell me, Ed. Let me guess. <laughs> uh, that's right. His name's O'Toole. Yeah. And I forgot to mention that Kathleen's pretty. Naturally. Anyhow, I let her go. I had to. And when I went around to talk to her this morning, she'd flown the coop. Any chance some of the next boys grabbed her? I don't think so. It looked more like she came home, packed in a hurry, took her kid, and blew. Kid? Yeah, eight-year-old daughter. Irish and a mother, too. I was on sacred ground. Oh, he was fingering me gun. <laughs> no, seriously, Johnny. Would you find her? She may be able to break Nick's alibi, and it's our only chance. And it might be her only chance. Nick Sharon's not the boy to leave a loose end lying around. I know. I've got 30 men checking bus depots, airlines. And no luck, huh? In this mess, at this time of year, I'm a hard-boiled cop, Johnny. I've got no Christmas spirit. I'm glad it only comes once per annum. Well, there's not very much to go on, that's for sure. I'll see what I can turn up, Ed. Check with you later. All right, that's fine. Oh, oh, oh by the way, Johnny. Yeah? Uh, about that friend of yours. What friend? Uh, the guy with the motorbikes. Uh, how, how would I be getting in touch with you? Oh, yeah, his name's Ralph Sterner. He's in the phone book, office in the Mackley building. Hard-boiled cop. <laughs> well, uh, the kid's only young once. Yeah, sure. Now, you find that O'Dare girl. Find her, keep her alive, and get her to talk. How long have I got to find her? Uh, what do you mean? Nick Shern. How much longer can you hold him? Johnny, he was turned loose an hour ago. So that was it. A lot of maybes, a lot of questions, and a lot of pressure. A job to be done and done fast. Find one Kathleen O'Dare, former hat check girl at the Shea Colette. Keep Nick Shern's hoodlums away from her and persuade her to talk. And three to one, Nick was looking for it, too. He was free now, on the loose. And he might be anywhere. Only the way it turned out, he wasn't just anywhere. He was in one particular place. Johnny. Parked right smack in front of the precinct station. Over here, Johnny. He was sitting in the back seat of a sedan, and his trigger man, Benny Stark, was at the wheel. Been there a long time, hasn't it, Johnny? About five years, as I remember it, Nick. It was that warehouse robbery over in Queens when you got away with $40,000 worth of furs. Uh-uh. You've forgotten. I was acquitted on that one. Oh, yeah, I know. After they pulled the only witness out of the East River, his feet in a bucket of cement. Just coincidence. I've never seen him before. You've seen Miss O'Dare before? Sure, I have. She works for me. She's a good kid, Johnny. So I hear. Well, I wouldn't harm a hair on that girl's head. She'll be relieved when I tell her that. Get in. I want to talk to you. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, Nick. I like it fine just the way it is. In the car, I'd be outnumbered. You got me all wrong, Johnny. I don't play that way anymore. What about Benny? Has he reformed, too? Well, if that's what... <laughs> Benny, go take a walk. Yeah, boss, but... I said go take a walk. Okay. Get in, Johnny. What's on your mind, Nick? You uh, working on this case? Yeah, I'm on it. Why? That's what I figured. I was talking to my lawyer in there and saw you go to Rafferty's office. I guess the insurance company's going to try to welch on that claim. It's your party, it? Nick. You talk. I got a better idea. What's that? You know, it's real nice out in Las Vegas this time of year, Johnny. A man can have a lot of fun out there for the next month with... Maybe $10,000 to play with. What man are you talking about? You. I don't have $10,000. You will. 30 minutes from now, if you say the word. Oh, Nick, you're lucky we're not standing out there on the sidewalk. In a car seat, I haven't got room to swing. You're still a fool, huh? I don't know. Why don't you write me about it? You'll have plenty of time. You're up there in the death cell. Suppose I didn't make any claim on that policy. Then you wouldn't have any reason to stay on the case. No sale, Nick. A hundred grand is a lot of money. I'd want to find out why you didn't make a claim. You know why. You're out to pin this on me, and so are the cops. A man with a record hasn't got a chance. You should have thought of that before you killed Mel Pranker. Want to know something, Johnny? I didn't kill him. Well, I'm betting you did. What do you care who killed him? You're not shedding any tears over it. No, but I'd sure hate to see you get away with it. And I'd hate it even more if anything happened to that girl. Kathy O'Dea? Now, what could happen to her? She just might fall in the river. She probably thinks she's safe as long as she hides from the police and refuses to talk. She doesn't know you very well. 
You had me all wrong, Johnny. You know, you hear a lot about peace on earth, goodwill toward men around this time of year. Well, I don't have much goodwill toward the kind of rat you are. And I figured there'd be more peace on earth if you weren't on it. Push me, and maybe that's what'll happen. Well, at least that's fair warning. Yeah, that's fair warning. I'm going to tag you for this, Nick. You can count on it. Expense account item two, $2.40. Taxi to the east side rooming house of Kathy O'Dare. I didn't have much hope of turning up anything. Ed Rafferty and his men had already been through the place inch by inch. But it was the only starting point I had. The landlady was out and a uniformed policeman let me into Kathy's flat. I spent an hour and a half and got nowhere. I went through her mail, bills, advertisements, casual notes from men she'd met at the club. But nothing personal, not even a postcard. There were no pictures, photographs of Kathy or her daughter anywhere in the flat. She made a clean sweep, then left in a hurry. And obviously, she didn't mean to be found. But I had to find her, and fast. It was dusk when I left. The street lamps were on, and the colored Christmas lights in the windows along the block. Snow was falling in big, soft, gentle flakes, and there was a holiday feeling in the air. It was neither the time nor the setting for murder. Make a contribution, son? Give a little something to help poor? Oh, Sure. How's it going this year, Santa? Oh, it's better than usual, but it just seems there's never enough to go around, no matter how... Well, bless you, son. Thank you kindly. Don't mention it. Good luck, Pop. Thank you, son. Well, the city ought to clean the streets better. I've been waiting for you. Sorry, Benny. It's not my day for punks. Get some friends want to talk to you. Start walking, Johnny, down the alley. Uh Uh-uh, it's dark down there. Start walking. This ain't just my hand in my pocket. It better be, Benny, with two cops standing up there on the porch watching. What are you talking about? There ain't no cops there. I smashed him in the mouth and knocked him flat. Followed it up and kicked his gun in the head. He rolled over, came to his feet and rushed me. I was hoping he was. Coming, son? He had it coming. Well, he, he sure did get it. Yeah. Hey, you know something, Pop? I think Benny wants to make a contribution to help the poor. Well, he ain't saying no. <laughs> oh, he's a good boy, at the moment at least. Here you go. That ought to help some. Two, three, four, five hundred dollars. Put it where it'll do the most good. Well, Merry Christmas, son. Happy New Year. Yeah, same to you, Pop, and many more of them. Hey, taxi! <laughs> There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the next Sharon Matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, an old lady with a broken arm, a shivering girl, and bullets in the snow. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. Gottler speaking. 
Cattler? I'm Kathleen O'Dare's landlady. Oh, yeah. I left word you wanted to talk to me. That's right. I'm trying to find Miss O'Dare. Do you know where she is? You a friend of hers? I think I will be once I meet her. I'm an insurance investigator. I want to help her. That's what the other one said. Yeah. What do you mean? What other one? The fella that come up here a while ago, short, mean-faced, shifty-eyed. Benny Stark? Was that his name? He didn't say, Mr. Dollar. I guess he was too busy. Busy? Doing what? Breaking my good right arm. I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, New York City, to the Home Office, Tri-Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Nick Shearn matter. Expense account continued. Item five, $2.30. Taxi to Mrs. Gottler's rooming house, the place Kathy O'Dare had called home until she disappeared. Mrs. Gottler. That I am. Well, look, I'm Johnny Dollar. I talked to you on the phone. It's all right. You can put that gun down. Well, I guess it's you all right. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I've only got one good arm left, and I'm aiming to keep it. Pull up a chair. Thanks. Oh, kind of rough boy, huh? Uh, I'd have showed him who was rough if I could have got a hold of my gun. I'd have blasted him, Christmas week or not. I'd have blasted him, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I know how you feel. And me with all these presents to wrap. How can you wrap presents with one arm? That is being a paper hanger. Well, I'll be glad to help out, Mrs. Gottler. I won't guarantee what they'll look well, like. Well, and I sure do appreciate it. And don't worry about their looks. I got to get them wrapped, is all. Oh, let's see now. Uh, this paper goes on that one. Oh, all right. It's a water muffler for my nephew over in Brooklyn. You know them terrible winters they have over there. Oh, yeah, they're frightful. Of course, it may be better this year. The Dodgers won the pennant. Ah, nothing but luck. It won't happen next year. <laughs> you never know. Hey, tell me something, Mrs. Gottler. How come Benny worked you over? Hmm? Why did he break your arm? Here. Stick this card on it huh? as soon as you get the ribbon tied. Oh, okay. No time of year like Christmas, I... Al- well, he wanted to know where Kathy went. When I said I didn't know, he jumped onto me. Said I was lying. If I could have got hold of that gun... Where uh, did she go, by the way? You aiming to break my other arm, Mr. Dollar? With all these packages to wrap? Here, hold your finger on that knot. I'll tie it tight now. The postmen in Brooklyn are always busting things open. I don't know. There. Well, that's one down. Where did you say she went? Oh, I didn't. No, this one I'll deliver myself, so it don't need to be wrapped so careful. All righty. Kathy lit out of here in the middle of the night. You think I sit up 24 hours a day spying on my rumors? You might, if the rumor happened to be one of your special favorites. Who told you that? What's the difference? She was, wasn't she? Kathy was everybody's favorite. Anybody that ever met her. Oh, you'll meet them as make remarks about a girl that works in a nightclub. But I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Dollar. Kathleen O'Dare is a finer lady as you'd ever care to find. And I would care to find her. Good luck to you, then. And if you do, let me know where she is. You helped her pack, didn't you? Now, how did you know that? Here, here, here. That's about as good as I can get it. Be careful when you deliver it, though. It's not tied very tight. I didn't know, Mrs. Gottler. I was guessing, but it figured. Kathy was scared half to death when she packed up and left here. All she had on her mind was to run and hide... She wouldn't have thought of stripping that flat, taking out every bit of personal identification. Somebody had to help her. Now, where'd she go? I don't know. Look, look, you don't get the idea. I'm on her side. She's up against a rough deal and doesn't even know it. You've had a sample of the way those boys play, and that was only a sample. With Kathy, it'll be a whole lot worse. They're looking for her, and sooner or later they'll find her. Her only chance is for me to get to her first, so you... I'm not lying, Mr. Dollar. I don't know where she went, and that's the truth to help me. Tried to get her to tell me, but she wouldn't. She said if I knew it would be dangerous for me. I helped her pack, yes, but I don't know where she was going. Well, that's that, I guess. I don't know where to turn next. She apparently didn't have any other close friends. I don't even know what she looks like. I've never even seen a picture of her. I was hoping you could... Well, if that'll do you any good, I've got one right here in my sewing basket. One what? A picture. What did you think? 
She gave it to me about a year ago. Said she's never had many taken, but here it is. Thanks. Real pretty girl, don't you think so? Yeah, she's lovely. Well, at least I'll be able to wreck. When was this taken, Mrs. Gatler? Now, how should I know? Three or four years ago, I guess, before she came here to the city. This photographer's address, the name of the town, is that where she came from, Brambury, Michigan? Why, yes, that's her hometown, Brambury. I'd forgotten the name of it. And she was just talking about it a week or so ago. She wanted to go home for Christmas, but she said she couldn't see. Mr. Dollar, do you think she might? Maybe. It's the most likely place a scared girl would run to, home. Anyway, it's worth a chance. Mrs. Gottler, uh, I love you. Why, Mr. Dollar... Why, Mr. Dollar. Expense account item six, $88.35. Hotel and incidentals in New York and transportation to Brambury, Michigan. Brambury turned out to be a lumber village, half hidden among the pine-covered hills. It was a little bigger than a wide spot in the road, but not much bigger. A foot of new snow had fallen within the past 24 hours. A fluffy white blanket lay softly on the trees and the housetops and filled the deep hollows in the frozen ground. Men in bright red flannel shirts drove horse-drawn logging sleds through the forest trails, and their shouts sounded sharp and clear, a crystalline tinkle in the icy air. Brambury looked like the place where Christmas was invented. It was beautiful. And very quiet when it came to putting out information. I found it out first when I tried the local telephone operator. I uh, just checked in here at the hotel operator. There doesn't seem to be a phone book, so... People steal them. That's why. Traveling people going through. Oh, uh, souvenir hunters, I suppose. How's that? Uh, look, I wanted to call the O'Dares. Could you put... not O'Dares. There ain't but one. That's old Mike. Oh, then that's the one I want to call. Would you mind ringing him? Won't do no good. He ain't there. He's slabbing up at number four mill today. Well, actually, it's his daughter I want to talk to. Daughter? Yeah, that's right. Kathleen. Do you know her? Just growed up with her, is all. Oh, well, would you mind... Are you a friend of hers? No, I've never met her, Where but... Where are you from? I came here from New York, What's but What's your I... name? Johnny Dollar. Now, will you please ring Kathleen She don't and... live here. She lives in New York City. I know where she lives. And what give you the idea she'd be up here? I'm psychic. you what? Look, where can I get in touch with her? I wouldn't know anything about it, Mr. Dollar, and I can't give out that kind of information. You better go on back to New York and write her a letter. Let me talk to your supervisor. Supervisor? Well, I'm all there is, so I guess that's me. Start talking. Forget it. You're welcome. I got the same kind of runaround from the hotel proprietor. As soon as I mentioned Kathy, he suddenly forgot his own name, age, and the time of day. One thing's sure, this town took care of its own. I wondered if the law in Brambury would take the same attitude. I decided I'd better go find out. As it happened, I didn't have far to go. On the sidewalk in front of the hotel, the law came to me. Just a second there, mister. Hmm? I'd like to have a little talk with you, if you don't mind. All right. It's quite a change to find somebody here who wants to talk. I understand you just got in from New York. Here on business? Look, you know why I'm here, but now everybody in town knows. Got any identification on you? Yeah. Have you? My name's Martin. Dan Martin. I'm the deputy sheriff in charge of this part of the county. Oh, then you're just the man I was looking for. Is that so? I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. I'm looking for a girl named Kathleen O'Dare. Do you know where she is? What do you want with her? I'm working on a murder case. She's a witness. Is there any kind of a charge against her? No, I just want to talk to her. What makes you think she's here? Are you a friend of hers, Mr. Martin? I've been in love with Kathy since we went to grade school. I'd be willing to die for her. Does that answer your question? All right, let me put it this way. You think you're helping her by hiding her out. All of you think so. But you're wrong. You're helping her right into her grave. Kathy doesn't figure it that way. She's scared. She doesn't know what she thinks. I know these boys who are after her. They don't play kid games. And sooner or later, they're going to find her. So if you love her and if you know where she is, you better take me to her before it's too late. I don't know. I don't know what it is Kathy's mixed up in. I didn't want to ask her. But I know it isn't the police she's afraid of. And I don't think it's you. No, at the time she ran out, I wasn't even in the picture. I'm on her side, too, Mr. Martin, and I've got to see her. Go talk to her father, old Mike. See what he thinks. 
He's not at home right now. Yeah, I know. He's out at number four mill. How do I get there? The county pickup truck is parked down the block. The tire chains bit into the packed snow and pushed the four miles of logging road behind us. It was late afternoon, and the sun had dropped behind the timbered slopes, throwing a pale sheet of cold yellow against the western sky. Here and there, a few scattered lights were coming on, in the windows of the village and the bunkhouses of the lumber camps. Bright white smarks against the darkening shadows. Emptiness, loneliness, and somewhere in it, a frightened girl in hiding. A girl who'd run away from the city of a hundred million lights and from an unsolved murder. Michael Deere was winding up a job working at the big slabbing saw, and I stood by and waited for him to finish. Be nice with you, Mr. Dollar. This is the last one. Okay. Well, that's the last of it now till after Christmas. Yeah, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. That's all right, Mr. O'Dear. My name is Johnny. Never mind, I know all about you. Dan Martin phoned, said you was on your way out. Mr. Dollar, the answer is no. I see. I thought it over since Dan called. Before I'd have anything happen to Kathy, I'd rather see ten murderers go and hung. Now, look, hiding out won't help as long as Nick Shearn is free. Kathy's in danger. He can't hurt her if he can't find her. I found her, Mr. O'Dare. Just by luck. There's not one chance in a million of... Sounds like a car. Ooh, the tarnation had drive out here this time of the evening. We walked over to the big door as the car had stopped about 20 yards away. A man got out and turned toward us. I was standing under the dock light, so he recognized me before I got a good look at him. He jumped back in the car and went for his gun. Benny Stark. Get back, Mr. O'Dare. It was too dark to get a decent shot. I tried once more. And missed, and the car disappeared behind the trees. Mr. Dollar, who was it? Was that one of them? That's right, Mike. They found her. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Nick Shearn matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a lonely vigil in the snow. A killer prowls the night. And a lovely lady vanishes. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. They've traced Kathy O'Dear here to your nice little town of Brambury. Who has? Nick Shearn's boys. One of them, a trigger man named Benny Stark, came out to the sawmill hill a few minutes ago. I traded a couple of shots with him, but he got away in a car. 
Did he head north or back toward town? Toward town, I think. You can't see the turnoff from here. All right, Dollar. You're packing a gun. Will you take the pickup truck and block that turnoff? Hold it until I can get somebody out there to relieve you? Right. How many deputies you got? Deputies? Uh-oh. What about volunteers? Is this Benny Stark the man Kathy's afraid of? He's one of them. Then I'll have volunteers. Twenty men within a half hour, armed with deer rifles. And every one of them a dead shot. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Brambury, Michigan, to the Home Office Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment: the Nick Shearn matter. Expense account continued. Item eight, three dollars sixty cents for two packs of cigarettes and a pint of Applejack borrowed from the foreman's locker at the sawmill. I figured these as standard equipment for holding down a roadblock at ten degrees above zero, and Mike O'Dare agreed with me a hundred percent. Well, I'll tell you one thing: they can make it out of corn, rye, barley, make it out of gold if they want to. Ah, uh, but they'll never come up with anything better than what they make out of apples. <laughs> here, here, have a short one, Johnny. No, no, thanks. I'll save it for later. Well, I'll just. Uh... It's got the taste of Indian summer in it. You ought to see this country around that time of year, Johnny. Break your heart, it's so beautiful. Well, it's beautiful now with the snow on. And it would be more so if there wasn't a killer running loose in it. Johnny, I want to ask you something about my daughter. And I want you to answer me honest. All right. It's no use trying to fool you. She's here, all right. I know. But she hasn't told me what it was that happened in New York. What she ran away from it. Somehow I figured it was just as well not to ask her. Your sheriff, Dan Martin, said practically the same thing. Dan's been in love with Kathy since he was 12 years old. He's a good man. Solid. So I figured. Anyway, she was scared. Scared half to death. And she'd come home for help, so we tried to help her. What was it you wanted to ask me, Mr. O'Dare? You mentioned a murder case, Johnny. You didn't give any of the details. Just said that Kathy was a witness. Is... Is she mixed up in this murder? And you wanted an honest answer. All right, I'm not sure. I see. That's why I wanted to talk to her, get her story, the truth. I realized from the start she might be guilty. I don't think so, but it's a possibility. You may as well know about it. I guess you realize it wouldn't make any difference. Not to me or to Dan. Oh, yeah, I figured. In other words, you're with me as long as I'm trying to protect her. But you'll fight me if I find reason to think she's guilty. That's about it, Johnny. Well, at least we know where we stand. And I hope it won't come to... What's the matter? Car coming. Light on the trees there at the bend. Yeah. Do you suppose maybe... Probably not, but you can't tell. Better get behind the truck just in case. You'll have to shift into low to edge past us. Let me get that spotlight on. Hey, I guess I'll just have another quick one. Wind cuts right through your bones. It's a dark-colored sedan. It might be him. Funny. I'd been hoping for two months that Kathy'd come home for Christmas. And I didn't figure I'd be out here in the woods, hiding behind a truck, waiting to shoot it out with somebody that wanted to kill it. It's a crazy world. Keep your head down, Mr. O'Dear. Yeah. Mm, just the driver by himself, wearing a dark hat. I don't know. You know... That kind of looks like... Huh? By golly, it is. What? That's Ted Perkins' old wreck. No doubt about it. And the... All right, you better wave him out past. He probably thinks we need help. Uh, uh, it's all right, Ted. It's Michael Dam. Go ahead, go ahead. We don't need anything. Yeah, uh, we're all right. Thanks anyway. Well, there's one thing about people around here. They mind their own business and don't ask no questions. And they don't answer them often, either. How's that Applejack holding out? Two long hours went past. Only three cars came out from the village. And each time, a long moment of tension while we waited to identify the occupants. But all of them were townspeople. Benny didn't show. One truck came down the logging road from the back hills loaded with dwarf spruce and fir. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. 
We were waiting for an assassin, but the truck only carried Christmas trees. The night was crystal clear with bright stars hanging low on the blackness, but it kept turning colder and colder. And to leave on the Applejack didn't help much. And the wind, too, changed gradually and blew fitful and gusty and strange. Ah, it's going to storm. Come a blizzard, maybe. Not tonight. Tomorrow sometime or tomorrow night. I know this country. I know the signs. Uh, there's an odd feeling in the air, all right. There's an even odder one in my leg. Log rolled over on it pretty near six years ago. Bothers me some in the winter. It's a lot worse, though, right before a storm. Well, that's kind of a handy thing to have. Well, that's one way of looking at it, I guess. Like one time when Kathy was little. When her ma was still alive. God rest her soul. We had a big measles epidemic here in Brambury, and every night Kathy used to add a line to her prayers. She'd say... And please let me catch the measles so I can stay out of school like the other kids. <laughs> now she's wanted as a witness in a murder case. And somebody's prowling out there in the dark trying to find her and kill her. Little Kathy. Who never harmed anybody in her whole life. Some things just don't make sense, Johnny. Some things never have. There was another time once when men like Benny were prowling in the dark trying to find a little child and kill him. And he hadn't harmed anybody either. That was nearly 2,000 years ago. Yeah, so it was. I like you, Johnny. Kathy will like you, too, and little Jill. Oh, oh there's a pair for you. That kid looks more like a mother did at her age. Another car coming, Mr. O'Dare. Yeah, so there is. And this just might be the one. Maybe. I sure wish that Applejack hadn't run out. But it was only a couple of men Deputy Martin had sent out from town to relieve us and take over. Big men, calm and quiet, wearing plaid Mackinaws and heavy lace boots and carrying Winchester 94s over their arms. They told us Benny Stark had been seen. He'd come up from the west, driven onto one of the roadblocks unexpectedly. In a flurry of shots, he'd broken through. The men couldn't understand his persistence. They thought he'd run for it, get out of the area once his presence was known. I didn't bother to explain, to put him straight, but I knew Benny had never run, not now. He was a trigger man, a professional killer with a reputation at stake. And he had his orders to silence Kathy O'Dare. A half hour later, we'll be back in town, turning into the main street around the village square. Strings of colored lights and a tall pine in the center of the square blinked and sparkled as they swayed in the wind. Around a hundred cars and trucks were parked in the street and in the lot behind the town hall. And the sound of singing drifted out from inside. They're practicing carols and things for the big doings on Christmas Eve. Ain't it beautiful? The men at the roadblock had given a description of Benny's car and the license number. It was just barely possible. Got something in mind, Johnny? Yeah, let's take a look through those parked cars. I don't know. If it was me, I sure wouldn't be hanging around here. I'd stick to the tall timber. Yeah, but you're not a city boy, Mike. Tall timber is foreign soil to Benny. He's only comfortable when he's close to a crowd. He the fellow that's supposed to have done that murder? No, it was the man he works for, a cafe owner, ex-gangster, a man named Nick Shern. Let's check that lot around at the side. I don't think he'd show here in front. He'd be taking a big chance showing anywhere. In a town this size, people know each other. It's his job to take chances. And he probably doesn't realize... Wait a minute. That sedan against the building with the side window broken. Seven, eight, two, one. That's his car, Johnny. Yeah, wait here. I eased my gun out of the holster and started toward the car. There were no lights in the lot, only the soft glow reflected from the packed snow underfoot. And the car itself stood in the dark shadows next to the building. I couldn't see whether anyone was in it or not. The singing seemed to swell louder as I approached. I moved slowly, watching for any sudden movement. <sighs> the car was empty. It was time, past time, to talk to Kathy O'Dear. And with the pressure tightening the danger close to home now, her father was ready to take me to her. We drove over to Dan Martin's house where it turned out Kathy and her daughter were staying. Dan's mother had been looking after her. 
Dan was there when we yeah. arrived, busy on the phone. Yeah, I know the car all right. The one Jed bought last spring down in Bay City. Seven, three, nine, two. Uh, where was it parked? All right, keep an eye out, Charlie. So long. Benny Stark has stole himself another car, huh? Took Jed Warden's station wagon. Well, what for? That was a better one he had. Charlie says the steering gear was sprung. I guess it happened when he crashed that roadblock. Well, how's Kathy and the young'un? Oh, fine. They were asleep upstairs. Uh, Mom's next door helping Mrs. Barton stuff a turkey. Johnny, you, uh... You figure it could wait till morning. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Dare. I've got to talk to her tonight. All right. I'll go wake her up. Mr. Dollar, no matter what she's done, don't hurt her any more than you have to. As far as I know at the moment, Dan, all she's guilty of is withholding information. And most people would have done the same thing. Nick Shearn's a rough boy to tangle with. She was scared, that's all. Lost her head. She never did belong in a city. She belongs right here in Brambury. This is her kind of life. Why did she leave? Well... Oh, we argued one day. And she said she'd show me. So she ran off and married that fellow. He treated her bad. Finally, he left her. But she was too proud to come back. She wouldn't have come back now if she hadn't have been so scared. Well, maybe it'll work out now. She ought to stay. Her kid ought to grow up here. Learn the outdoors and the woods like Kathy used to know it. Why, she roamed through those hills like a young Indian. Knew every trail in that forest. Every timber camp and trapper's cabin from here to the ridge. I remember one time the two of us were up toward... <clears throat> What's the matter? What is it, Mr. O'Dear? You said... You said Jill and Kathy were asleep upstairs. Ain't that what you said, Dan? Of course that's what I... Mike... What's happened? They're not up there. They're not up there anywhere else in the house. They're gone. <laughs> There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Nick Shearn matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a little girl who believes in Santa Claus, a big girl who believes in very little, and both of them facing death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Dollar. Mike O'Dare, Johnny. Any sign of Kathy? No, the boys at the highway turnoff haven't seen her or Benny, either one. Not a soul out that way in the last hour. What about there at the sawmill? Nothing, Mike. No fresh tracks on the logging road, no sign of her. And the worst thing is, it's starting to snow again. Yeah, here in town, too. Dan Martin just phoned. No luck. She hasn't shown up at any of the roadblocks. She's, she's around somewhere, and we've got to find her. We will, Mike. And it's got to be fast, Johnny. There's a blizzard coming up, and that gunman Benny Stark is around, too. Maybe he's already found her. Maybe he even took her from the house, her and Jill both. 
Maybe she didn't get scared and run. Maybe it was him. Maybe he snuck Mike, in stop and... it. That kind of thing is not going to help any. Well, what is going to help? I don't know, but I've got a half-baked idea, and I may be right. Stay there at the house. I'm coming back to pick you up. And one thing you can do while you're waiting. What, Johnny? Pray. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Brambury, Michigan, to the Home Office, Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Nick Shearn matter. Or more important, find Kathy O'Dare. Item 12 on expense account, $4.90. A tank full of gas for the county pickup I'd borrow from Deputy Sheriff Dan Martin. The falling snow was thickening now, and the wind was rising and steadying in the northwest. The night had all the makings of a blizzard. And wherever Kathy and her daughter had gone, we had to find them before it hit. It was 10.14 p.m. when I pulled up at the side porch of the Adair house. And Kathy's father came hurrying out to the truck, leaving the door open behind him and buttoning his heavy Mackinaw as he ran. Any news, Mike? Not a thing. All right, get in. Shut the door. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get a foot of snow before morning with a zero wind behind it. Now, listen, Mike. I think we can forget any idea that Benny found her and got her out of the house. In that case, she wouldn't have taken your car. He's already got one. I know. I thought of that. And he wouldn't have given her time to dress herself in jail the way she did with heavy clothes and snow boots. And she wouldn't have taken the rifle. Then what has happened? She knew I'd be there to talk to her sometime this evening. I think she lost her nerve, couldn't face it, decided to run again. Maybe so, but where, Johnny? That's what I want you to tell me. What? No, I don't mean you knew what she was going to do and where she was going to go or then help how to... do you think I can tell you? Look... Kathy knew about the roadblocks Dan Martin set up to trap Benny Stark, knew where they were. So if she didn't want to be seen, then naturally she'd avoid them. She couldn't, not if she wanted to get away, take the highway to Flint or Detroit. She'd have to pass one of them at least. But she hasn't passed any of them, so she's still in this area. And I don't think she ever meant to leave it. But then... Dan Martin said Kathy used to spend a lot of time in the woods when she was growing up. He said she knew every back trail in these hills, logging camps, trappers' cabins. She did. She used to worry that Dickens ought to be the way she... Yeah. Now, where would she go, Mike, if she wanted to hide out back in the hill somewhere? There's a lot of places. Chippewa Canyon's one. Three or four timber camps abandoned in the winter. Some cabins along the... No, no, she couldn't make it. There's a roadblock before you get to the turn off there. It's got to be some place she could reach without being seen. Well, there's... There's Barker's Flats. Yeah, but that's 12 miles by foot trail. She wouldn't try it in this weather, not... Not with Jill along, anyway. Then there's... Lake Pine. No, it's over the other way. Pine Lake Road. Where's that? Runs northwest of town. Not much better than a wagon road. Dan didn't put a block on it because the dead Dan's at the lake about five miles out. What's out there? Nothing at the lake. But you can go on up Pine Creek about four miles on foot, and there's some cabins. Maybe a waste of time, Johnny. Let's get going. Expense account, item 13, $6.90. One dry cell electric lantern, an extra pair of batteries picked up at the Brambury Hardware Company on the way through town. The falling snow, driven by a bitter cold wind, formed a dense curtain in front of our headlights. And from the turnoff all the way up the narrow twisting road to Pine Lake, I had to keep the truck in second gear. There were car tracks in the road, all right, several of them. But they were covered now by the new blanket of snow. And it was impossible to tell whether they'd been made earlier tonight or a week ago. The road ends a couple of yards past this next turn. And we'll soon know. There's four or five side turnoffs, clearance where where you can park. We'll have to check all of them, I guess. All right. That draw there on the right, that break there in the trees, that's that's where the Pine Creek Trail starts. Well, we'll swing in it. Mike, I guess we won't have to check those turnoffs. Huh? Is that your car over there under the trees? Yeah. That's it. <laughs> I left Mike waiting in the cab while I went over to look inside the car. It was empty, abandoned. And there was no note, no clue of any kind to tell where Kathy had gone. I raised the hood and felt the motor block, ice cold. The car had been here for some time. I flashed the lantern on the ground and followed the faint tracks made by two pairs of snow boots. They entered the deep draw that led back into the hills, the start of the Pine Creek Trail. 
I snapped off the lantern and stumbled through the snow back to the truck. What'd you find, Johnny? It's them, all right. They've headed up the trail. I found tracks in the snow. Well, then we'd better get started on. No, no, wait. I'll go after them, Mike. You take the truck. Go into town. Find Dan Martin. Bring help as fast as you can. That storm's getting worse. No, you don't. I know the risk. Starting up that trail with a blizzard coming on. And if you think you're going to protect me by sending... Knock it off, Mike. There's no time. And you're wrong. I'm not protecting you. I'm protecting myself. What do you mean? That bum leg of yours. I don't want you on my hands, too, along with the girls. All right, Johnny. I'll go after Dan. And hurry, Mike. I'm depending on you. Yeah. Good luck, Johnny. See you, Mike. I stood there in the snow watching the headlights of the truck move away. Finally, they swung around the bend and disappeared. And I suddenly felt more alone than I ever had in my life. I'd gotten rid of Mike deliberately, sent him away on purpose, because I hadn't told him everything. I could see no point in tearing his heart out. There was another car parked on beyond Kathy's, nearly hidden by the trees. Jed Horton's station wagon. The car that had been stolen by a killer named Benny Stark. It took me half an hour to cover the first mile, and the storm kept getting worse. The beam of the lantern penetrated a bare 30 feet ahead of me before it was smothered out in the white blackness of the night. After a few hundred yards, the tracks I was trying to follow had nearly disappeared, snowballed over, and blotted out. I gave up looking for them and stuck to old Mike's description of the trail, following the left bank of the frozen creek. The drifts were deeper down along the creek bottoms, and the going was rougher. But I didn't dare leave it to look for better footing. It was my only landmark. The trail itself was buried. And any man who lost his way tonight and wandered off into one of those side gullies would wander straight to his death. An hour passed. Then an hour and a half, or two hours, maybe. I lost all track of time and distance. The wind cut through my clothes, and the numbing cold crept into me deeper and deeper. Gradually, the walking, stumbling, breathing, even thinking became automatic and without feeling. The world itself seemed to narrow down to a tiny circle close around me. And all beyond was chaos, blackness, and roaring storm. I tripped over fallen logs and floundered back to my feet, dropped my lantern and recovered it, broke through the crusted drifts and struggled for footing, and kept on moving. In the weird nightmare of the blizzard, I could hardly recognize reality when I came face to face with it, when the beam from my lantern touched him, crouching by a tree a few yards away. I could barely accept him as being real. He'd been watching my light as I approached, waiting for me. It was Benny Stark with his gun leveled and aimed. Don't be a fool, Benny. Drop that gun. A curtain of snow swept between us then, blotting out the sight of him. I was grateful. I turned and stumbled on into the storm, moving in pitch darkness now except for the ghostly glow from the snow-covered ground. The second shot had smashed my lantern. I had nothing left to go by but instinct and luck, and they weren't enough. Within 15 minutes, I was hopelessly lost. That's when I started hearing the music. Miles from no place where there couldn't be any music, except inside my head. The cold and fatigue were finally doing their work. I knew the signs. The next step was to start wandering in circles, smaller and smaller ones, and the last step, to drop exhausted and go peacefully to sleep. Peacefully and permanently. But the sound kept growing louder, and I moved in the direction it seemed to be coming from. It couldn't be just illusions. It had to be real. Hello! Hello there! Then suddenly, only a few yards away, a brilliant blaze of light exploded from the darkness. And it seemed that a golden-haired girl was standing in the middle of it. And for a moment, my sanity tottered. Who 
was out there. My golden vision was wearing blue jeans and a flannel shirt and was holding a rifle. She looked exactly like the photograph I'd seen of Kathy O'Dare. And the blaze of light came from an open cabin door. Who is it? Speak up or I'll shoot. Oh, thank heaven. Hold him, Astaire. It's Johnny Dollar. Are you getting warm now? I don't think I'll ever get warm again. You will if you don't move away from the stove a little. The back of your shirt is starting to smoke. Yeah, I, I thought I was beginning to feel something. How's the firewood? There's plenty. And plenty of food. And a radio. If I hadn't heard that music, I'd have blundered right on past this cabin. Oh, we've got everything. We can hold out for a month if we have to. And I hope we have to. What about your daughter? Is she all right? Sure. She's fine. It's a picnic for her. A camping trip. And she's sound asleep back there in the lean to Dreaming about Santa Claus, I suppose. I wish I could. How did you find me, Mr. Dollar? A hunch. Guesswork. I was born under a lucky star. I wasn't. Oh, I don't know. I think you've been pretty lucky, considering everything. More so than your landlady back in New York. Mrs. Grappler? What do you mean? Betty Stark went to see her. Tried to find out where you were. When she wouldn't tell him, he broke her arm. Oh, no. Oh, the poor woman. Oh, it's a rough game, Miss O'Dear. Trying to play it cozy with a mobster like Nick Shearn. You know, of course, that he sent Benny here to find you. He'll have a hard time finding me in this place. He did find you. What? Maybe he followed you from the house or saw you drive through town. Anyway, I ran into him back down the trailerways. I thought I heard shooting a while ago. You did. He tried to ambush me. He thought he had the drop and he wouldn't give up. I had to kill him. be another intriguing episode in our story of the Nick Shearn matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the showdown. Victory and then disaster. When a visitor to the little town of Brambury turns out to be death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? Spell it. J-O-H-N-N-Y-D-O-L-L-A-R. That's not right. You forgot to capitalize. Hey, you're right, honey. Let me hear you spell your name. Okay. Capital J-I-L-L, Jill. Capital O, apostrophe... Apostrophe. I never can say that. Capital D-A-R-E, Dare, 
course, my last name's actually something else. I forget. But my mother says I'm really an O'Dare. Not the least doubt about it. I can see it in a minute. I like you, Johnny Dollar. And I kind of like you, too, Jill O'Dare. You think my mother's pretty? I think she's lovely. Then why don't you get married to her so I can have a daddy? Well, that's, um... Well, it's certainly something to think about. And, uh, not a bad idea. Now, I'll be quiet before you wake her up. I'm already awake. And with a plot like that being hatched, I think I'd better stay awake. Is there coffee, Johnny? <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location a small cabin in the timber outside Brambury, Michigan, to the Home Office Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment? The Nick Shurn matter. Expense account, final page. Item 15, $1 million for a certain feeling. I realize, of course, that the amount of this item is somewhat unusual and may be cause for mild criticism by your accounting department, unless the accompanying report includes an adequate and detailed explanation. Therefore, to avoid unnecessary correspondence and delay, I am attaching said explanation herewith. Here's your coffee, Kathy. Thanks. How long did I sleep, Johnny? Oh, a couple of hours. It's around four in the morning. The storm hasn't let up at all, has it? No, it's worse, if anything. Jill, honey, it's four o'clock in the morning and your eyes are just about to fall out. Now, you go back there and go to sleep. Do I have to, Mommy? You have to. Run along now. Mr. Johnny Dollar and me were having a lot of fun until you woke up. <laughs> well, that's life, sweetie. Night now. Good night, Jill. Good night. Proud of her? I'm crazy about her. That's what you mean. She's a great little girl. She's the only thing I ever did in my whole life that turned out right. That bad, huh? Johnny, it's no good. I know why you're here. I know what you expect from me, and the answer's no. You're jumping the gun. I haven't asked you anything. You will. You haven't done all this for nothing. You're going to ask me to come back to New York and testify against Nick Shearn. I might ask you to tell the truth. Is that just another way of wording it? I didn't see anything, hear anything. I don't know anything about it, and I have nothing to say. So Nick Shearn gets away with another murder. I wouldn't know anything about that. And sooner or later, of course, he'll kill you, too. He sent Benny Stark out to do it, and Benny missed. But he's got other boys, or he might even handle the job himself. Why? By now he ought to know that I'm not going to tell. But there's always that chance you might change your mind. And Nick's a gambler, but he likes the odds on his side. He doesn't take chances. Whenever he can, he stacks the deck. I wish I could help you, Johnny. But I don't know anything about it. I left before it happened. How long have you worked for Nick Shearn? Known him? Two years. I'm not wide-eyed about him, Johnny. I've heard what he's been, what he may even still be, a gangster, hoodlum, racketeer, but that's none of my business. The club was, was legitimate. My job there was on the level, and he never got out of line once. And no doubt he's always been kind to his mother and loves dogs and children. I wouldn't know, except children. He's crazy about them. He was always buying something for Jill, asking about her. And he also shot and killed Mel Pryker. I couldn't say. I see. Well, you're letting a lot of people down. People here in Brambury that you grew up with, people that love you, your father, Dan Martin. What have they got to do with it? You know, it's a great country up here. I'd like to spend more time in it. And it's big country, big and beautiful and dangerous, like that blizzard outside there. It's not the kind of country that turns out cowards. Cowards? Your father said something yesterday. That some people belong in cities and some don't. And that you're one of the second kind. He was right. The city's made a coward of you. You don't understand. And they know it. Oh, Mike, Dan, all of them. Of course, they'll never mention it. But you're letting them down and they know it. And you know it, Kathy. They don't have a daughter to think of. It's not her fear we're talking about. It's yours. All right, I'm scared. 
I've got reason to be. It's easy for you to talk. You don't know what fear is, what it can do to you. I don't. It can push you and drive you and make you do things you hate yourself for. And it can destroy you. How would you know? How would any of them know? Who haven't felt it, who haven't been there. Kathy, you're not alone. We've all been there. It's not the fear that's important. It's the courage you bring up to fight it. I've tried. I've, I've nearly gone crazy trying to think it out. But it always comes back to one thing. Jill. She's what counts. Nothing else matters. And if you love her, teach her to grow up without fear. Sacrifice anything if you have to, even your life. But teach her courage. There's nothing greater you could do for her. <laughs> It's all right, Kathy. It's all right. It's all right now. I knew what was right, Johnny. I knew all the time. Sure, sure. Of course you did. All you needed was a little push. Want to tell me about it now? I... I was there at the club that night. When it happened, I stayed after closing. I had some presents for Jill, and I wanted to wrap them before I took them home. Nick and Mel Pryker were upstairs in the office. Nick was there? Yes. I could hear them arguing. They didn't know I'd stayed. And then... Go on. I heard Mel yell out. He said, no, Nick, no. And then I heard the shots. Yes? I didn't even think. I ran up to the office. Mel was lying on the floor, and Nick was standing there with a gun. He told me to get out and to keep quiet if I wanted to keep on living. That's it, huh? Yes, Would you make a statement to the police, testify at the trial? Yes. Oh, good. Will you help me, Johnny? Will you stand by me? You know I will. You've got to because I'm scared. I'll be scared all the way, but I'll do it if you'll help me. I'll help you, Kathy, all the way. Why don't you curl up here and get some sleep? Come on. Maybe now I can sleep. It's going to be all right. Thanks, Johnny, for giving me the push. Oh, sure, honey. You know something, Johnny? I'm with Jill. I like you, too. She went to sleep with her face against my chest. And after a while, little Jill came tiptoeing in and curled up on the other side. And I sat there holding them both, thinking and waiting for the dawn... So that's what I mean about a million-dollar feeling. True, it wasn't my little girl, or my big girl either. But for the moment at least, well, that item still goes. I'll still tag that feeling at one million dollars. And I was sorry when the storm was over and a rescue party came up from town. Because I felt I'd had one moment in a lifetime that I'd never find again. The big event of the year in Brambury was the Christmas Eve show in the town hall. There was music and a pageant and singing, and everybody took part in it, from the youngest kid in town to the toughest old grizzled lumberjack from the back hills. Jill was in the children's chorus, and old Mike was to operate the spotlight, so they went on ahead. I took Kathy. And since she wasn't quite ready to face people yet, we made a point of getting there late. I didn't care when we got there, as long as I was with her. We slipped in quietly and took seats at the back of the room. The string group from the high school orchestra was playing, and no one noticed us. Not even old Mike, Kathy's father, who was working the spotlights. I hope Jill does all right. She hasn't had any time to practice with us. Oh, she'll do all right. We'd been there about ten minutes when somebody else came in and slid into the one seat between us and the door. I didn't look around until I felt Kathy stiffen beside me. Oh, no. It was Nick Sherman. Nobody gets excited now or makes any sudden moves. We just sit here quiet like. He slid his hand over to feel inside my coat under my arm. Now packing around, huh? Perfect. I'd left my gun at Kathy's house. Old Mike had been dubious about it, but with Benny dead, I'd seen no reason to carry it. And after all, it was Christmas Eve. All right, now we're going to ease out of here now without attracting no attention from anybody. You're crazy, Nick. You're crazy. Shut up. And just don't forget one thing, now. I'm not holding this gun on you. He's aimed right at the middle of Kathy's back. Let's go. Johnny. No choice, Kathy. Come on. The back of the room was dark. Nobody paid any attention. Somebody was always leaving or coming back in. Oh, 
Come on. I got a car over at the side. Johnny. Watch your dollar. We'll be right back, Mike. Just gonna get some air. All right, Johnny. But don't go running out before I give you your present. Huh? Here. And don't uncork that until you're ready for some serious business. All right, I'll... I'll... Re... Thanks, Mike. Thanks a lot. Don't mention it. Good luck, Johnny. Now, come on, let's get away from here. Johnny, he's going... Take it easy, Kathy. Wait for me! Oh, what... Oh, no. Jill, go back! I want to see Uncle Nick. Why'd you tell me you were coming here to hear me sing, Uncle Nick? Well, uh... uh listen, Pick me Jill... up. Please, Uncle Nick. Take your hands out of your pocket and pick me up. Uh, look, Jill, you run along now. Who's that? Dan Martin. He's a deputy sheriff and he's a dead shot. Better do like she says, Nick. Take your hand out of your pocket and pick her up. Uncle Nick? All right, reach in my pocket, Johnny, and take my gun. <laughs> Later, Kathy and I walked around outside. We could still hear the children's chorus singing inside. Jill saved our lives tonight. No, she saved Nick's life. What do you mean? That present your father gave me, up there at the spotlights. He could see what was happening, and he thought real fast. That present was a gun. Then you... I had Nick covered from the time we stepped off the porch. I'm glad he didn't move. I'm glad it happened like it did. Yeah, so am I. I thought we'd never see those stars up there again. You kept hold of yourself, Kathy. You showed a lot of courage. No. But maybe I can learn to show it. I was just thinking, Johnny, looking at the stars up there. There was fear in the world then. Two thousand years ago. And... He had courage. Expense account item 16, $230.40. Incidentals in Bramberry and transportation for two adults and one child. Bramberry to New York. Expense account total, $486.20. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all of you. From all of us here on the program. And God bless you. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Peggy Weber, Don Diamond, Ben Wright, Jack Crucian, Barney Phillips, Sam Edwards, and Ken Christie. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.